Hey guys. Uh, Merry Christmas. Luke, you made it. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm like losing motor skills here. I can't even open the books. Um, all right, I guess what I'll do first is go ahead and have you open to Luke chapter 2. That's where we'll be. Uh, and then we'll flip back over to <clears throat> just a cut, should be just a couple pages back in your Bible. You'll flip back over to Mark chapter 7 um, after this. Um, <clears throat> my little girl's at home watching me. Ramsey, she's sick, throwing up. So, hey, Ramsey. Um, uh, Brittany couldn't be here, so I hate that. But, um, she, yeah, hey, Britt. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, uh, I'll, I'll talk to you. I want to tell you a little bit about how this message came to be because it, it's really, it's really going to be non-traditional. I mean, it's not going to be, you know, probably anything that you would think. Mark seven for Christmas message. But I think back in the springtime, uh, Curtis had maybe asked me to preach, or I can't, I can't remember if we were talking about it, or maybe he said something, get ready, or maybe I was just inspired. I can't remember how it really came, but I had this message. And it was going to be like a springtime thing or maybe early summer. And I'd pictured the word clean and I'd pictured like clean linen, you know, like hanging on a line, you know, out drying in the, in the uh, sun. And uh, I, I was really wanting to preach this message to the congregation. And uh, for whatever reason, it never happened. Well, when he came to me and said that I had to do a Christmas message, well, I knew that I would do a Christmas message because we usually do that year in and year out. And... Um, somehow it led me back to Mark 7 and I, I don't really know like I, I have notes upon notes of different things and ideas and things that I felt like God was speaking to me and um, God just led me back to Mark 7 and kind of framed the Christmas story around Mark 7 and um, uh, I, I, really, I really believe that God We'll do a, can do some major work here this morning. I really believe that. Um, and uh, so, like I say, I, I don't know. It's just, it's just something that I've been a little bit apprehensive about, but I just I feel like it's the Lord's will. I feel like this is where we need to be today. So um, the, this is going to be, this is going to also concern the shepherds. There won't be a nativity scene that you see or a play that you see, a Christmas play with a nativity scene in it that won't include shepherds. I was always a shepherd. I never made the big role of, of uh, Joseph or, you know, any of the big roles. And that, always too big for Jesus. So, uh, just, I was always a shepherd. But uh, the shepherds play an important role, and, and God can use their story in a mighty way today. I, I really believe that he can. So, uh, we're going to pray. Uh, and then, uh, well, actually, let's go ahead and stand. I want to have you stand. We'll uh, honor God's word uh, by the reading of his word. This is going to be a short couple of verses. We'll pray, and then we'll get right into it. This is going to be right out of Luke chapter 2, and it's starting in uh, verse 8. And it says, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were sore afraid. Let's pray. Father, we love you. And Lord, I just ask for your help this morning. I pray, Father, that you would come in and that you would sit with us a while, that you would um, help me in the teaching and the preaching of your word. I pray, Father, that you would just uh, help me to decrease. And Father, I pray that you increase in this place this morning. God, I trust you. I know this, this is what you want us to uh, hear this morning. I pray, God, that you would prepare hearts and minds and ears to be able to receive uh, what you've already uh, have in store for us this morning, God. We love you so much. We thank you so much for the privilege to be able to meet, to gather, to study your word, to sing about you, to uh, just lift you up and glorify you this morning, Lord. We love you. We trust you. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. You can be seated. All right. We're going to go into a little bit of, uh, we'll, we'll read through a little bit of Luke chapter 2, and then we'll get right into Mark chapter 7. So at the start of Luke chapter 2, verse 1, and this is the uh, Christmas passage. Uh, I don't know if Dylan's here today. Is Dylan here? No, I told Dylan, he, got, he kind of stole my thunder last year. He, we, we read the Christmas story, and, 
and uh, as a family on Christmas, and, and he got to. And I'm like, dude, you know, how did it skip from Curtis to you, you know? <laughs> Thought I was next in line. But anyway, um, I was going to mess with him a little bit, but he, I don't know if he's here. But anyway, uh, we'll start right here. And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one into his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in a swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in, in the inn. I heard a guy say last week, if, if she had a shred of dignity about her in the social atmosphere that she was in, if she had a shred of dignity, that there would have been room somewhere. Okay, so that just gives you an idea of the way that Jesus Christ came into the world. Low, at best, she was a teenage maid. And that's the best possible scenario for Mary. And that's the way that God came, into, came to earth. Isn't that amazing? So, no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone about them, and they were sore afraid. Now, we're going to... The shepherds were afraid, okay? And there's kind of a reason for that. Well... You would be afraid too, I think, if the, if the night sky cracked open and there were angels. But there was something, there was something more going on there, okay? So we're going to study that a little bit. Who they were, why were they afraid, what was really going on here when, uh, when the heralding of Christ coming to earth, when, that, when this heralding came about, why was it given to the angels? Who were they and what was going on here? So Mark chapter 7. And we studied Mark um, really in depth in my class and this came out this kind of came out of a series of messages and it was based out of a book called King's Cross by Timothy Keller we kind of use that as a study guide so um, I'll reference him later on in the message um, a, a quote from this book but uh, this kind of came out of that study in the book of Mark so this is on up in Jesus's life he's probably um, his ministry has undoubtedly started he's probably 31 uh, by now somewhere around in that neighborhood so this is kind of on up past the birth and he's already ministering his ministries began and uh, he's walking around doing the things that he did chapter 7 verse 1 and there was always no, no matter where Jesus entered no matter what setting he entered there was always tension um, and, and people would always the Pharisees in particular would always try to trip him up and a lot of times you would see public displays of this and it wasn't like the Pharisees would come to him and kind of inquire Lord teach us your ways, uh, Jesus, teach us what you, what are you trying to say here? Is there something we're missing? It was always that they wanted to trip him up and find fault in what he was doing so that they could hang him, so that they could kill him, so that they could get, get rid of him. Because Jesus, to be honest, had hurt them financially. And he had hurt them in, as far as their, um, just their clout and, and, and their respectability. He had, had kind of hurt some of the things that they were really passionate about. So here's another instance in chapter 7. They came together unto him, the Pharisees, and this is verse 1, and certain of the scribes which came from Jerusalem. And when they saw that some of his disciples eat bread with defiled, that is to say with unwashing hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all of their Jews, except they wash their hands oft, eat not, holding the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the market, except they wash, they eat not. And many other things there be which they have received to hold, as the washing of cups, pots, brazen vessels, and of tables. They're washing everything, even washing couches, furniture, whatever. They're just washing everything. And he answered them and said to them, Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites. Now what they were doing right here, what they were doing in this instance, was, again, not trying to inquire. Why, why, why don't you guys, now why don't you guys wash like we do? That wasn't the, that wasn't the air of this conversation. They were like, hey, Jesus, why, are your, why do your disciples not washing their hands before they eat? And why are they defiled, that is impure, because of the not washing of hands? Why are they impure, and why are you cool with that? That's basically what they're asking him. Why is it okay that they don't wash their hands, that this makes them defiled before God, and you're cool with that? Like, what's up with that? 
Jesus comes to him and he answers him. Well hath Isaiah prophesied of you hypocrites, as it is written, this people honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Howbeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And what's going on here with all the washing and all the cleanliness laws is that Jesus said, you guys right now in this moment are elevating commandments of men and traditions of the elders, as fancy as you want to make that sound, you're elevating that above the commandments of God. Okay? So when you talk about wash this, wash that, wash that, you're putting that over what really makes us dirty and what really can make us clean. You're elevating that to a place that it was never meant to go. So he goes on and he describes, he starts to break this down for him. And he said to them, Full well you reject the commandment of God, that you may keep your own tradition. For Moses said, Honor thy father and thy mother, and whosoever or whoso curseth father or mother, let him die the death. But you say, if a man shall say to his father or mother, it is Corban, that is to say a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, he shall be free. And you suffer him no more to do aught for his father or his mother, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which you have delivered, and many such like things you do. And uh, we, we talked about this this morning. This is kind of what my Sunday school class, what my message was built around this morning. And a lot of that doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us. But, what, but in reality, what's going on here is Jesus takes one of the most clearest commandments in all of the commandments of Scripture as far as a heart that is in tune and following God. He takes one of the clearest commandments. Honor your father and mother. And it's a commandment like no other else. It offers a blessing and a curse. And he says, you take one of the clearest commandments of Scripture... And you, and you put your wants and your desires above that by declaring things Corban all the time. And what he meant, and I tried to explain this a little bit this morning, is like, let's say that my parents were getting up in age. Okay, they're getting up in age, and it's time for me to take care of my family. My mom and dad have taken care of me for so long, now they're getting up in age, it's time for me to begin caring for my family. Let's say that this gold-plated reindeer is something that they would need in their old age, okay? Now, this is just an example to try to explain to you what's going on. So let's say I have this gold-plated reindeer, and they need this in their old age, and this is very, very helpful to them in their old age as they begin to have different needs and different, you know, things that they need to help them along through their old age. Well, I don't want to give up this reindeer, okay? I know that by doing so would honor my father and mother, but I'm going to tag this Corbin, and they can't have it. And what that would mean is that when I declared something Corbin, I meant this is for God's use. And I would say, man, dad, mom, I know that you need this, but this is for God's use. I'm sorry. But really, in reality, I'm just selfish, and I want to keep it for myself, you know? And he said, you guys do things like this all the time. He says, there's many other things you do, is what the Bible said right there. There's many other things you do like this. You take clear commandments of God, and you bend them around your wants and your desires, and we do this. We're guilty of this. Now, I know God says this about sex, but we really, really love each other. And, I, and I'm pretty sure he's going to understand. I know the Bible says, be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. But I only get drunk a few times a year, and it's really important times that I get drunk. And we bend clear commandments of Scripture to fit our lifestyles. And we, can, and we continue to do that. We do these things. And, and, and truth be known or truth be told right now is we're all guilty of things like this. Well, it's just a white lie. You know, it's just a white lie. And in, re in reality, and we'll try to kind of butter it up. In reality, it's better that I tell this lie because it, re you know, it really helps the situation out a little better. And we lie. Or we do things like this and we bend clear commandments to fit our lifestyle. Now there's something going on there. This is not just about morality. Okay? This is, there's something going on here. So he digs a little bit deeper. And he begins to open up. He then, after he does this and kind of lays the bomb right there to the Pharisees, he gathers the whole crowd in. He says, everybody come in here and let me tell you something. Hearken unto me, every one of you, and listen to me and understand. This is what he says. There is nothing from without a man that entering into him can defile him. But the things that which come out of a man, those are they that defile the man. And he says, nothing you take in your body can defile you, can make you impure before God. Okay? 
So if you look at an alcoholic and you look at the act, and although the act is unpleasing to God, what makes him impure and unclean before God is not the alcohol, it would be the heart. Does that make sense? When Jesus would talk about money, it was never about money. It was about the heart. When he would talk about sex and lust, it wasn't so much the act, even though it was, it was uh, wrong as far as the, the way our temple is and the way our body is. What made us un, impure and unclean and defiled before a holy God was the heart. It wasn't so much the act. And what he says is you guys think that you can manage your acts enough to where you can be declared clean before God. And it will not work. It won't work. You can never manage your acts and, and, and the, the, the motions that you go through through, a daily, through the course of a day to be declared clean before God. You will always fail. I will always fail. There's no, no one in here that can do that. Nobody. Nobody can do that. So he breaks it down. He says, if any man has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he was entered into the house of the people, his disciples asked him, and they say, what are you talking about, Jesus? Like, what's going on here? And he says, do you not understand? Do you not perceive that whatsoever thing from without entereth into the man, it cannot defile him? And he says, listen to me. And he gets very graphic here. And he says, literally what the text reads like is he says, you eat food, and it goes through your intestines and into the toilet. That's literally what the text says. And it goes into the toilet. And he says, it never touches your heart. Your heart is dirty. But it's not the food you've been eating, right? Your heart's dirty, but it's not the food that you've been eating. It's not all these things that you've been doing, and you can't manage them to make you right. Because it entereth into his heart, but not into the belly, and goes out into the draught, purging all meats. And he said, that which cometh out of the man, that defileth the man. For from within, out of the heart of man, and he begins to talk about all of our conditions. Before a holy God, he says, out of your heart comes evil thoughts. And I'll just steal something from Matt Chandler right here to make this point. And he mentioned this in a, in a message one time, and he said, there is not a person in this room, if we ran the thoughts from your mind from this past week across this screen, that would stay in here. He said, you would run out of here in shame. And that's the carnal nature of man. And we are, we're helpless before a holy God. We really and truly are. If we stand on our own merits, we're helpless before a holy God. He goes on, he says, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lasciviousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, all these things come from within. And they defile the man. So, back to the Christmas story. Man, I, this may be too heavy for Christmas. I don't know. Uh, back to the Christmas story. Let's go to verse 9. Because everything that was defiled, everything, all this defilement and uncleanliness, you're about to see the epitome of it. Okay? Look at this. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were sore afraid. Why were they so afraid? Listen to this. This is out of a commentary. Bethlehem itself was a very interesting place. In the time of Jesus, it was a picturesque place. It sits high on a cliff, composed of limestone, and for that reason, as the sun hits the limestone, it can be seen in all directions. The grazing fields where the temple shepherds tended these flocks are in the valley south and east of this town beneath the limestone cliff. So what is ritual defilement? In the middle of this grazing area was a structure known as the Migdal Ader, or the Tower of the Flock. This tower was used by the priest who oversaw the shepherds. By remaining in the Migdal Ader, the priests were able to keep themselves from becoming ritually defiled, which is what we just talked about. So what is it? Well, if one reads the book of Leviticus carefully, it becomes clear, clear that there were a multitude of things people living under the law had to do to please the Lord and to be in right standing. 
Among those were prohibitions against making contact with feces or dead things. When these things occurred, there were a number of purification rites that had to be strictly observed. In a society fanatical about cleanliness, shepherds stood aside. They were never clean. It was impossible to be clean and to, and to do the work of a shepherd. They were constantly walking about in excrement and touching dead things, and both activities left them in a state of ritual impurity. Because of their defiled conditions, shepherds were not even allowed to go into the temple to offer sacrifices or to go in the synagogues. And in this culture, there was not a rela- it wasn't like they would go into the fields and have a relationship with God and look at the stars. Because in this culture, you were defiled. You were unclean, and, and, and religion was corporate. So when I wanted to talk to God, it had to take place at the temple. No way I could kneel out in the field and look up at the stars that he made, by the way, and pray to him, okay? No way you could do that. you got to do this, this, and this to be clean. So they were constantly in a state of defilement. Don't you think that they bought into that lie? Don't you think that they walked around with an air of shame around them? You could never be in right standing before God. You are defiled. You can't even come to the temple. Oh, you're a shepherd? You can't even come to the temple to worship. Oh, you want to offer sacrifices? You can't do that. I'm sorry. You're defiled. We can't let you do that. Don't you think that they would begin to start believing that and walking in that shame and walking in that lie? That is the lie of religion. You'd better do this, this, and this to be in right standing. You'd better not cuss. You'd better not drink. You'd better wear this. You'd better go to this church. You'd better do this, this, and this. And it's a set of laws, and you live by the law. And the Bible says, and this is really scary, that if you do that, that's fine, but you will also die that way. Because if you want to live by the law and you want to try to live morally pure, you'll die morally impure because you'll never reach it. So here was a bunch of guys, a bunch of misfits, outcasts in a field, and God cracks the skies. Guys that couldn't even come to the temple to pray, worship, or sacrifice, God cracks the sky. And you know what he says to those nasty shepherds, defiled, could never stand before God? You know what he says to them? He says, good news. Because for you in the city of David is born a Savior. For all men, is what he said. For all men. Listen to this. Let's look at it. This is the account of the the Bible. And the angel said to them, fear not. They were afraid. You know why they were afraid? Not only the image they were seeing, but they were afraid because of their defilement. It probably didn't take them long to realize what was happening, who, you know, what was going on. This is obviously supernatural. This is God. They're talking God talk. This is, I, I'm not supposed to be here. You know what he said? He said, don't you be afraid. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall to be all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. Isn't that amazing? In this, in this day and age, there was a day of atonement. And they would have a high priest come in. And all of the nasty stuff that we just talked about, He would go in year in and year out and he would offer sacrifice for the sins of the people and for himself as well because he couldn't keep it either. And he would go in year in and year out and he would offer sacrifice for the sins of the people because they couldn't keep the law. They would fail and fail and fail and every year the high priest showed up again to offer sacrifice because they would fail and again because they would fail. They could not keep it. So when Jesus came, the Bible says that when he came, he was what? Prophet, priest, and king. All three separate offices in the Old Testament, all encompassed by Jesus Christ at one time. And that middle word, priest, when Jesus came and he became our high priest, The Bible says in the book of Hebrews that he offered a sacrifice once and for all. And he didn't go back year after year because he didn't have to, right? 
He was a perfect sacrifice. And we need to talk about the birth, and we need to talk about the cross, and we need to talk about the empty tomb, but we need to remember his atoning sacrifice, his perfect life that he kept that law that we just discussed. He kept the law, the Mosaic law, the Levitical law. He kept all of these and fulfilled them. He didn't do away with them. He fulfilled them, right? So that we could stand what? Clean. So that we could stand clean. I can't do it. I put my trust, my hope in the one that could do it. And I'm clean before God. And that relationship that was fractured in the Garden of Eden is restored on the basis, on the foundation of Jesus Christ. I can't do it. I fell all the time. If you ran my thoughts up there, I would run out of here. We're all like that. We all needed a Savior, everybody in here. And the cross is the great equalizer. There's people in here that think that they don't need to clean themselves up, but they do. And there's people in here that think they're too dirty to to, to ever stand before God, but they're not. And God brings us all up to level, level playing ground. You cannot stand before a holy God on the basis of your own merit. You'll never get in compared to my holiness. I'm gonna close right here with a story. Um, and this is out of this book, and I'm going to ask um, Caleb, you can come up here in just a second and, and, and start playing here in just a minute. This is, this is, kind, of, this is kind of a lengthy illustration, but I'll, I, I have to tell you this. Like, I have to get this story out there to you because it makes this so beautiful what Jesus was coming to do as the high priest, as he was coming, as he was born, the fact that he came. And by the way, the fact that he came, if, if we could do this on our own morality— Like, if you could have kept the law, if you could do that, he wouldn't have came. Right? Was the law given for us to keep, or was the law given for us to show us that we could never keep it? It showed us how broken and how poor we were before God, spiritually speaking. Listen to this. This is out of a book called King's Cross. If you, if you want a good book to read, read this book. It's, a, it's almost a commentary. It reads almost like a commentary on the book of Mark. Outstanding. I mean, it is awesome the way that he breaks down the book of Mark. So this is out of King's Cross by a man named Tim Keller. And, and in the part where he begins to talk about the role of the high priest in Mark chapter 7, he recalls on this guy by the name of Ray Dillard. And he was an Old Testament professor at Westminster Seminary. And he recalls this message that he spoke about the role of the high priest. And I want you to get this because it will blow your mind what the role of the high priest was, what he had to do before he could appear before God. Okay, listen to this. He says he wept through most of this sermon, and it was based on Zechariah 3. Zechariah is one of the prophetic books in the Old Testament. And in the first line of chapter 3, Zechariah, in a vision, is transported into the center of the temple. And he says, then the Lord showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. So Zechariah is transported into the temple in a vision. And he sees Joshua, the high priest, and he's before the Lord. What a sign it must have been, right? Listen to this. The temple had three parts, the outer court, the inner court, and the Holy of Holies. The Holy of Holies was completely surrounded by a thick veil. Inside was the Ark of the Covenant. On top of it was the mercy seat and the Shekinah glory of God. The very presence and face of God appeared over the mercy seat. It was a dangerous place. In Leviticus 16, God says, If you come near the mercy seat, put a lot of incense and smoke up in the air because I appear in the cloud over the mercy seat and I don't want you to die. Only one person on one day of the year was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies, the high priest of Israel on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. Zechariah then was experiencing a vision from the center of the temple inside the Holy of Holies, and he saw Joshua, the high priest, standing before the Lord. Ray Dillard, preaching his sermon, then drew on his scholarship and spoke in great detail about the enormous amount of preparation that took place for the Day of Atonement. Listen to this. This is before he entered the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. A week beforehand, the high priest was put into seclusion, taken away from his home and into a place where he was completely alone. Why? So he wouldn't accidentally touch or eat anything unclean. Clean food was brought to him. You've got to make sure that you don't eat that. That'll make you unclean. Okay? We, we, we got to eat this food. And he'd wash his body and prepare his heart 
following the, Le- 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 the, Levi- the Le- Levitical laws, sorry, Levitical laws, the night before the Day of Atonement, he didn't go to bed. He stayed up all night praying and reading God's Word to purify his soul. Then, on the Day of Atonement, he bathed head to toe and dressed in pure, unstained white linen, and he went into the Holy of Holies and offered an animal sacrifice to God to atone or pay the penalty for his own sins. After that, he comes out and he bathes completely again. New white linen was put on him, and he went in again, this time sacrificing for the sins of the priests. But that's not all. He would then come out a third time, and he bathed again from head to toe, and they dressed him in brand new pure linen, and he went into the Holy of Holies and atoned for the sins of all the people. So he washes, he bathes, clean linen, he goes in. He has to come back, he has to redo it for the priests. That was for himself, but then he does it for the priests. Then he does it again for the, the people, all the sins of the people. Did you know that all this was done in public? The temple was crowded, and those in attendance watched closely. There was a thin screen, and he bathed behind it. But the people were present. They saw this. They saw him bathe, dress, go in, come back out. He was their representative before God, and they were cheering him on. They were very concerned to make sure that everything was done properly and with purity because he represented them before God. And when the high priest went before God, there wasn't a speck on him. He was as pure as pure could be. Only if you understand that do you realize why the next lines of the prophecy in Zechariah 3 were so shocking. Listen to this. You get that in your mind. Pure white linen, washed three times. The right foods, all the right things, everything. Prayed all night. And he goes and he appears before God and he sees that. He sees Joshua standing before God after he's done all these things. Okay, Zechariah saw Joshua the high priest standing before the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. And Joshua's garments were covered in in excrement. This is mind-blowing. What you see here is our best. If you did everything that you thought that you could do, every commandment that you thought that you could keep, and that was your basis upon entering the kingdom of God, God, look what I did. I've washed, I've done this, I've done that. Here's the high priest, the picture of our best, the cleanest we could possibly be by our own merit, and he's covered in excrement before true and pure holiness. It's amazing. Listen to this. He was absolutely defiled. Zechariah couldn't believe his eyes. Ray said the key interpretive question is, how could this have happened? There is no way that the Israelites would have ever allowed the high priest to appear before God like that. Ray's answer was this. God was giving Zechariah a prophetic vision so that he could see us the way that God sees us. In spite of all of our efforts to be pure, to be good, to be moral, to cleanse ourselves, God sees our hearts, and our hearts are full of filth. All of our morality, all of our good works don't really get to the heart, and Zechariah suddenly realized that no matter what we do, we're unfit for the presence of God. One thing that I thought about as I read that, do you, do you remember what God said in the book of Ezekiel about Israel when he found them? When he found Israel, what what did he say about him? He said, when I found you, you were like an aborted baby in a field. This is Ezekiel chapter 16, if you want to read it. And I said to you, in your own blood, live. And it was nothing that you did, and it was nothing that you could do, but I said to you, in your own blood, live. And it was the work of God, and it was the power of God, and it was nothing that we could do. Now listen to this. Just as he was about to despair, he hears this. Take off his filthy clothes. And then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin, and I will put rich garments on you. Listen, I'm going to bring my servant the branch, and I will remove the sins of this land, which you have been trying to do year after year after year after year. I will do that in a day. Listen, Zechariah probably couldn't believe his ears. He must have thought, wait a minute, for years we've been doing sacrifices, obeying the cleanliness and all. We can never get this sin off ourselves. But God was saying, Zechariah, this is a prophecy. Someday the sacrifices will be over and the cleanliness laws will be fulfilled. How can that be? Centuries later, another Joshua showed up. Another Yeshua. Jesus, Yeshua, Joshua. It's all the same in Aramaic, Greek, and Hebrew. Another Joshua showed up. And he staged his own day of atonement. One week beforehand, Jesus began to prepare. At the night before, he didn't go to sleep. 
But what happened to Jesus was exactly the reverse of what happened to Joshua, the high priest. Because instead of cheering him on, nearly everyone he loved betrayed, abandoned, or denied him. And when he stood before God, instead of receiving words of encouragement, the Father forsook him. Instead of being clothed in rich garments, he was stripped of every garment he had. And he was beaten, and he was killed, naked, and he was bathed too, Ray Dillard said, told us, in human spit. Why? 2 Corinthians 5.21, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. God clothed Jesus in our sin. He took our penalty, our punishment, so that we, like Joshua the high priest, can get what Revelation 19.7.8 says, Let us rejoice and be glad. Find linen bright and clean he has given us to wear. Pure linen, perfectly clean, without stain or blemish. Hebrews 13 says Jesus was crucified outside the gate where bodies were literally burned. The garbage heap, the place of absolute uncleanness so that we can be made clean. Through Jesus Christ, at infinite cost to himself, God has clothed us in costly, clean garments. It cost him his blood. And it is the only thing that can deal with the problem of your heart. And it's so true. In the book of Isaiah, he was prophesying to a people that were in rebellion. And they would offer sacrifices, and they would have festivals, and they would have parties, and they would do all this in the name of religion. And God comes to him through the, through the word of Isaiah, and he says, Man, I hate your festivals. I cannot stand your offerings. And he says, Take care of the poor. Love each other. And then he says one of the most famous words in all the scripture. He says, come let us reason. Though your sins are as scarlet, they'll be as white as snow. I always wondered, man, is snow that white? Just so God could show us how white we can be? Like how clean we can be? I don't know. Maybe. You ever walked outside and it just hurts your eyes, the sun, after a fresh snow? Jesus says, you trust in my righteousness. You'd be as white as that snow. Does this remove us from Christian duty? By no means. Paul said, how are we who are dead to sin? How can we live therein? This should light the fire for zeal for the Lord more and more. Not take away from the responsibility to keep His commandments, but light a fire of love for His commandments like never before. Because why wouldn't we? If we realize the state we were in and then, and then the state positionally that God brought us in through the birth, or through the birth uh, death, resurrection of His Son, then why wouldn't we do those things? Why wouldn't I want to keep His commandments? Of course I want to. I love His Word. I love His commandments. I love what He tells me to do, to not do. I love it. David, in the, in the book of Psalms, what blows my mind sometimes is that he, he's, he's under the law. And he says, I love your law, Lord. I love to keep your commandments. I love it. It wasn't chains and bondage to him. He loved the Lord. And I pray that you do too. I pray that you can see this. God takes the shepherds, these nasty shepherds. And, and, and if you follow, if you, if you look back in Luke chapter 2, right after that, you know what they do? They just run and tell everybody. Look what God has done. You know, we just, y'all just sang that in the choir. Look what God has done. And the shepherds, God takes dirty shepherds who couldn't even pray in the temple. And he says, you're going to be my first evangelist. Go tell them all about me. Go tell them that I've been bored. Go tell them that I came. And go tell them that I had to because you, you could have never made it on your own, but I loved you so much that I sent my son to offer a way back to a right standing and fellowship with him. He is so good. Dwell on that this Christmas. You know, I know that this, this is, you know, this seems more evangelistic like to, to, to the lost, but I'm telling you, you, we have to remember this, guys. We have to keep this close to our hearts. I think it was C.S. Lewis who said, may we always keep our nose close to the cesspool of our own hearts. May we always remember who we were and who we have the potential to be. God comes in and he transformed our hearts, right? He gave us a new heart. He gave me new wants, new desires, and all these things. And there's still a nature that I have to be very, very careful of, very, you know, very weary of. I can't let myself fall into these things. But through the power of God, he's strong enough to save and he's strong enough to keep me. He's a good Savior. He came for us. He came for us. Let's celebrate him this Christmas. I'm going to ask that you all bow your heads and close your eyes. Caleb, if you want to play. Everyone just bow your heads and close your eyes. 
And my, and my first invitation is this. I want to talk to all of you who may have not given your heart to the Lord. And man, maybe you've even been relying on good things. Maybe you do attend church regularly. Maybe you do read your Bible. Maybe you've, maybe you've been re relying on good things to get you clean before God. And today you realize that it's not going to work. It won't work. It pleases His heart, but it won't work on the basis of the right standing. For those of you who have never been saved, to see nothing better. There's no one in this room that will judge you. There will be nothing but celebration here and in heaven if you do this. If you've never been saved, if God has never saved you, there's no relationship there. Maybe you've been afraid. Maybe you feel like the shepherds. Maybe you feel like you're too dirty. He's told you already this morning that you'd never be too dirty for Him. You surrender that to Him and He'll take you. He'll bear you. never been saved and you want to be saved this morning, I want you to raise your hand. I just want to pray with you. I want to just pray for you. You've never been saved and you want to be saved. You don't have to understand everything. You don't have to know everything. All you know is that you've got a busted heart. And that you want somebody to come in and clean it up, save it. Next thing, I always do this because I have no idea. God speaks in a million ways. If God has spoken to you in any way possible, I want you to raise your hand and say, God, I heard you this morning. Thank you, Lord. A lot of you. Awesome. I want to ask you to just come. If you, if you feel the need to come and pray, I want you to just come to this altar today. It's week before Christmas. Man, what a special time. Just come and pray. Just come and thank you. He's our Savior. Come and thank Him for saving you. 